Hi everyone, Mike McConville here again, Stratford, Ontario, Canada for String Tech Workstations. Jeff is another collector that uh, has a bunch of guitars that needs some tender loving care. This is a Duesenberg Super Craftsmanship. This is their version of a Bigsby. Absolutely beautiful. This ES335 Custom Shop uh, guitar uh, is in as well. Also, Jeff had mentioned that he's had five or six Gibsons and he's always ended up selling them because he couldn't keep them in tune. Well, we'll get this thing tuning within an inch of its life. Count on it. So like many other collectors that I've worked for, Jeff drove the distance, 100 mile round trip, to get these guitars to me. These are the first four of his uh, collection. And like Jody from Pennsylvania who basically drove a thousand miles round trip, Mind you, he did have 11 guitars he brought, so uh, well worth his while. And I don't think he's finished yet. Uh, for my U.S. customers, please keep in mind that I am a one-man shop. No one else is going to touch your guitar but me. And I do have to book these instruments in. So I, I don't stockpile guitar repair. I take a small amount, I finish what's on my plate, and then I book in the next batch. So please, before shipping or uh, driving up, contact me. If you are shipping, please let me know well ahead of time. I'll need to give you the proper HS codes for importing and exporting. So the Duesenberg and the 335, I'm doing them in tandem. See the high spot at the neck to body junction? Okay, there is a little bit of discrepancy on the treble side as well. It didn't show up with the larger straight edge. This does need to be edge dressed. Once you edge dress those frets, this time of year they'll never need it again. There is some fretware. This guitar is being played. So we'll get rid of all that fretware and we'll take care of those high spots at the neck to body junction. Now just eyeing that neck, I can see that there's definitely more of a swoop on the treble side than there is on the bass side. So one of the things you need to understand is the truss rod goes up the center of the neck. The neck does not necessarily react nice and even treble side, bass side. So we pretty well got that as straight as we possibly can. There is definitely a high spot on the treble side here. Here's another Gibson nut coming out like an impacted tooth. And as always, we'll get it right out on the glue line. And this is what we ended up with. We still managed to get it out nice and clean. We'll move in and just check up on what the CNC machine missed. Okay, so with the shortest straight edge, definitely got some tick in there. And at the top end, right here. There's another, another spot, just right there. So these are all spots that... The CNC machine actually did a fairly reasonable job on this one, but it still managed to miss a few spots, but that's alright. We're going to get them now. There's a bit of fret wear here anyway, so it needed a full dress. Another reason to remove the nut. Obviously we're putting a compensated nut in, but this also gives us full access to the full length of the neck. This is another example of a trade where bigger is not better. Better is better. I started on this end, moving obliquely along the trajectory of the string path and kind of backing up to that first fret. Now I'm going in the opposite direction, still going across the crown, keeping the file in line with the strings, and just breezing over that and nicking all those high spots. So we still need to recrown, polish, and buff, but this thing has arrived. To demonstrate, let's check that again. So this is now perfectly level. That's taken care of. Okay, now we're ready to recrown. Once I get away from the from the body, I can actually follow right through with the crowning file. As I get close to the body, I start at the highest part of the arch and work to the outside, and then I'll have to come around the other side to finish the job. I've had four guitars in in the last week where the strings were hiked up because the guitar was buzzing. That's not the solution. 
This 400 grit will take care of the tooling marks of the file. Here's a slightly different angle of the dressing. The pivoting neck assembly pivots, restricts the flex under load, there's no steel post up the back of the neck, I haven't put the guitar in a vise, and there's no CNC machine. Now we've gotten rid of all the trace marks of fret wear all the way along right up to the 10th fret. And we got those high spots that the CNC machine missed. We've recrowned. Now we're ready to polish. Now the process begins, so we'll play a B, and we will tune to that note B. We're setting up the bridge right now. And octave. I think that uh, bridge pickup is a little too close. You can see that tuner kind of wavering, so I'm going to drop that pickup down a little bit while we set this up. That's better. So let's go back to our E. Here's another example of a saddle that's run out of travel. The G string on this guitar has never been in tune since the date it was manufactured. That's got to be pulled out, flipped 180, and reinstalled. So let's get this retention spring off first. Then we'll get at that third string saddle. You flip that 180 to buy a little bit more real estate in the adjustment. So D. And octave D. Okay, so that's actually a little flat, which is a good thing, because that means we've got plenty of room for adjustment. So we'll pull that forward a little bit. It was flat, so the string was too long, so we shortened the string to get it to tunes. And try it again. Good. That's good. An octave. And it's sharp. So here's our G. We may have to flip this saddle actually. We're just about running out of real estate here. If this doesn't do it, we'll have to flip that second string saddle as well. An octave. And that is still flat. That B string just snapped. But you know something, we're close enough to the mark that I'm going to put the fresh strings on now. And I'm not completely sold on this particular guitar going with a wraparound. I'll verify that when I put those new set of strings on. A couple more things to point out. 
The tolerance on these machine threads, that's rocks, that needs no help at all. It's perfect. But my real concern is this. See that? That is definitely too loose. These posts go right in the body, so they're rock solid. The wheels are, eh, they're a little sloppy too. I'm going to wrap those in some Teflon tape. Okay, no, that's much better. This one, still a little clackety there. We're going to wrap that post as well. So I'm wrapping it in that direction so that it doesn't unravel when I thread that thumb wheel back on. And that's good. Much more comfortable with that. Okay, the thumb wheels are tightened up. See this slop here? That is moving. That's moving like 12, 14 thou easily enough to put your intonation out. We'll put a little snippet of heat shrink on there. Now I have approximated that height. I put the bridge on with a straight edge to make sure that we're uh, we're in the zone here as far as final action. If anything, I may drop that action down a bit. Okay, let's see how we do now. Press that on. Oh yeah, that's what we wanted. Well, as I suspected, there was no reason to do a wraparound. I mean, we got about three threads exposed on that bolt. There's nothing wrong with that. As you can see, there's still space underneath both outside strings. That tailpiece is almost tight to the body. When you do a wraparound when it's not needed, the strings end up being too high and you don't get a steep enough angle to get them to seat firmly in the notch in the saddles. Those strings were pretty sloppy on the back side of the bridge. Anyway, this firmed everything right up. Uh, this is bugging me. This pickup is kind of tilting forward a little bit. I'm going to balance that out. Even this one's kind of tilting forward a little bit. I'm going to balance those pickups out so that they're in line with the trajectory of the string path. So this pickup should be sitting more like that. So we're going to pad those pickup cavities, both of them, to balance those pickups out. Yeah, this will be a little trickier to get a balance. I'm going to have to use a higher density foam block. It will only get contact on one side. So in this case, I just put that higher density foam block in the corner just to catch the underside lip of the pickup cover to balance the bridge pickup. So I opted to go with a mid-density peel and stick foam block to put on the fingerboard side of this neck cavity. This levels the pickup out so that both coils are equidistant to the strings. Okay, there's your bridge pickup. And that's pretty well perfectly level with the string. And there's your neck pickup. Huge difference just padding those cavities. We have a much steeper angle here, and this gives us much more purchase at the focal point on the saddle. So, my gut feeling was right. This is an example where you don't do a wraparound. I also wanted to bring you in close to show you that this saddle was flipped, so it had to be renotched. This saddle was also flipped, had to be renotched. And this saddle was not notched properly in the first place. So, now you can see. The strings line up beautifully with the pole pieces of the pickup and they're equidistant from the outside of the fingerboard on both sides. Okay, here's another example where we find trouble in paradise. So the Gibson scale length is 24 and 5 eighths of an inch. This rule, the number one is dead center on the 12th fret. Have a look at this. This fingerboard is a sixteenth of an inch short. That 13 is actually 12 because I've got the 1 at the center of the 12th fret. So it's actually 12 and a quarter instead of 12 and 5 sixteenths. And that is probably why this was driving Jeff crazy trying to tune this guitar. And this is a note for all the students and newer Patreon subscribers that jumped on board for the compensated nut package. This is an exception to the rule. I'll zero in and show you what I needed to do in this case to get this guitar to play perfectly in tune.
Well, as I started into this compensated nut with the 11 to 49 strings of concert pitch, the first people I thought about are you guys, the Patreon guys and the students. This is a whole different ball game here. It's a compensated nut, but not like you're used to. When I'm done, you'll hear exactly how in tune this guitar is. So compared to your regular sort of cantilevered compensated nut, this is actually the opposite. So the procedure on this type of compensated nut is quite a bit different than what you've seen so far. I start by scribing a center line and I cut those slots nice and deep and then I go to the front face. Let me show you. On a couple of these strings you're close to dead center. The overall procedure for this particular compensated nut, that's the 24 and 5 8 inch Gibson scale with the 11 to 49 strings tuned to concert pitch. The line on top, I do not uh, put that curvature on the top because I want to use that line as a reference point for the intonation for all of these strings. The other cautionary note is as you bite into the body of the nut then the actual bearing ledge becomes more and more narrow. So what that means is that your files are going to cut a lot faster than they would going across the full width of the nut. So you really want to proceed with caution when you're filing. We're very close at this point, so I'm going to breeze across those nut slots, check my string spacing as I go. It looks like that second string's got to move over a little tiny bit. And then bring all of these strings very close to their final depth. Now I still make a conscious effort to direct those strings to their prospective posts to reduce the amount of binding at the nut. you got to go real easy at this point. You really don't want to have to start over. And I think that all of you need to be prepared for the fact that you probably will take a couple of runs at this. It's very involved. I know in the level 2 classes some of the students got pretty frustrated with this procedure but it's all worth it in the end. So now we'll tune the guitar back up to concert pitch and we're checking all of the notes full length. Well here's the wrap up, stem to stern. We started at the tailpiece, it was wrap around, we nixed that idea. And I have to say in this case the the actual tailpiece posts and body inserts were rock solid, they didn't need to be wrapped, they didn't need to be touched, they're perfect. Next, the threaded posts that go into the solid wood uh, stringer block were rock solid, they didn't budge, but this whole bridge was slopping around on those thumb wheel adjusters. And the thumb wheel adjusters themselves were, they were a little bit sloppy too. So I did wrap those with Teflon tape. Although it, it obviously indexed onto the post, it was still slipping and slopping around. So I put that little piece of heat shrink on there and got a beautiful press fit. So that was taken care of. Now it's rock solid. Next, you know, we intonated the saddles, they weren't even close. So for perfect intonation, I did end up, as you saw, took a couple of saddles out, flipped them 180 and put them back in. The final touch here, after doing all that, is I wicked a little bit of medium strength Loctite, which is a liquid nylon, onto these threads. I also wick it into the press fit heads that press fit into the casting of the bridge because they tend to pop out and slop around. This is medium strength Loctite, so it's completely reversible. If you needed to adjust these, which you never will, this thing will never go out of tune again and there would be no reason to adjust it unless you were changing strings in the whole setup. But it plays buttery smooth and perfectly in tune and I'll demonstrate in a second. Okay, next. So we did end up padding those pickup cavities to level out the pickup coil so that it's sort of equidistant from the string front coil and back coil. And I actually dropped the pickups down a little bit because they were so close, you could see earlier in the video. When you see your tuner wavering, that's the first thing you want to check. Oftentimes those pickups are adjusted way too close. Anywhere from about 3 30 seconds of an inch to an eighth of an inch. That brought us up to the base of the neck. Well, once again, I corrected what the CNC machine missed, so I did dress full length, recrown, polished, and buffed them out to a mirror shine. So those frets are now flawless. Okay, next. So when it came to doing the compensated nut, 11 to 49 at concert pitch, 
on this particular guitar. So this threw a major curveball. As you saw earlier in the video, the fingerboard on this guitar was cut a sixteenth of an inch short. Each guitar I do, I start with a nut blank and I intonate specifically for the gauge of string, the scale length, and the tuning. So this is a moving target and it's a great example of, you know something? A robot will never take my job because each guitar is finessed within an inch of its life. Like To get this perfectly in tune, I will demonstrate it in a second. You'll hear for yourself. You be the judge. I saw that Jeff had a TU2 tuner in his case, which is probably the first serious tuner. And this one's been around the block. You can see chips out of the paint. I mean, these things were designed to whip in a brick wall and they'd still tune your guitar. I thought I'd change it up today and use a different tuner. So here's a TU2 Boss tuner. Here we go. So E, octave E, B, octave B, uh, and then open E and F, first fret. A string, octave A. E on the A string, seventh fret, octave E on the A string. So A, A sharp. D, octave D, seventh fret on the D string, nineteenth fret. Open D string again and D sharp. Open G string, 12th fret. Open G, G sharp. There's open B and octave, octave B, F sharp, 7th fret, F sharp, 19th fret. Open B string again and C. Open E, octave E, B at the 7th fret, B at the 19th fret. Okay, last one. Open E string and TU2 has just verified. Two different tuners, same result.